Everyone, welcome to Chrono. <laughs> Chrono Knots. Chrono Knots. There you go. Somebody's helping me. Thank you. Chrono Knots, a science fiction, classic science fiction lit podcast. And uh, this is your host, Yifang Yu. And with me are Anne, JM, and Nate. Say, say hello, everyone. Hey, guys. Hi. Hello. Greetings and salutations. This is our inaugural podcasts um and we'd like to welcome everyone brand new listeners and uh in, in some ways you don't have to have read science fiction in some ways one of the, the goals is to if you've never read any science fiction it's a good starting point it's to hear kind of what is this genre what is this whole thing about and you know please tell me and, and send us some lists to read and you know this is one of the goals of our podcast is to broaden people's mind about science fiction genre as a whole and uh, all four of us are fans of science fiction and um, our goal is to kind of pick a, a book or maybe a series of stories or some something in print that is in the classic science fiction literature realm and we will kind of traverse through it uh, hence the name chrononauts we're gonna just traverse through that and um, i don't think necessarily in chronological order but it's gonna be an interesting ride and journey regardless and so that's kind of our podcast we're gonna pick a, a work um uh, each uh x amount of time we haven't really even determined how frequent we're gonna do this but um whatever that is uh the next time you'll you'll hear about kind of what we're gonna do next and then we're gonna go from there is essentially go into stuff like frankenstein victorian era uh material and so forth and so on so we're going to pick some material read it and kind of discuss what the significance of that material is historically and also just what we like about that work and hopefully it'll inspire people to get into this genre more so that's our goal for this podcast um so that's the quick introduction what this podcast is about who we are very quickly but we're, for this for the purpose of this particular podcast what we're going to do we're going to go around uh, make just very quick introductions you know we're going to talk about who we are where we come from very briefly and uh why we're into science fiction but first let's just you know how let's just start with you know how we got to know each other and then two we're going to figure out you know how we became si fans of science fiction lit and finally uh our our quote unquote feature discussion today essentially is going to be what is science fiction so that's going to be a really broad topic <laughs> i'm looking forward to it now so and then uh before we get all that started let's get going on um how we kind of got to know each other so i will i will just start because you know i got this idea i can't remember when maybe it's been months years maybe um i've always liked you know science fiction i read uh, some of it when i was growing up but I gotta say, uh, I've never been a huge reader growing up. Um, it was because of my high school teacher, probably sophomore year when I was in high school, that uh, he was, the way he spoke was so literate. Like the way that he just spoke English wasn't even normal speech. <laughs> just the way he spoke was inspiring me to read because of the way he spoke. So I really loved literature after his classes, after I completed that grade. And we read the classics, of course, being in high school, you know, stuff like Odyssey and just this random school, uh, not random, but the set uh, school curriculum. So he truly inspired me to, I think, transform the way I, I viewed literature. Before then, I, I don't think I knew anything about it. I was kind of ignorant, to be honest. But afterwards, I, I've got to say, I think he lit in me just a passion for reading that th there's so many things I wouldn't have ever read because of him. So I first got to thank the teachers. They're always, you know, the best. And so <laughs> he's in inspired me to get reading in that. And so, um, anyways, um, 
once I got sort of really into it, I still didn't really read a lot of science fiction. I read other things. Um, it's only in the last about maybe five to ten years I got reading more, and especially in the last year. I would say that in, in the last two or three months, um, I read uh, Asimov's uh, Robot uh, Empire and Foundation series in like a matter of two, two or three months or something. The whole thing, just real fast because, um, I don't know, I heard about it. Um, and Apple TV is making a uh, adaptation of the Foundation series. I think they're shooting in Ireland and just got, I just got inspired. It's like one, I mean, I love watching science fiction sort of media, right? Like in terms of TV movies, but two, I just never really read it. I was like, I got to read, I got to really, you know, uh, satisf satisfy this itch of just, you know, finishing and reading the actual classics, you know, firsthand. So I went on that Mary adventure and got it and I just got really like, I got lit on fire all about it. <clears throat> and I found that Facebook group called science fiction, Facebook group. And it's a private group, and um, I don't know the history behind it, but I joined it, and I post a bunch of stuff about it. Um, and uh, I got connected to JM here, uh, who is also, uh, I think all of us are members, am I right, of the Science Fiction Facebook group? Uh, I don't think, Nate, you're in that group, are you? Which group is that? The Science Fiction Facebook group. It's about 65,000 people. It? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I actually, uh, no, I asked. I don't think I am. Okay. I, I've actually known Nate for a long time, and I asked him to join our foursome because I felt like, uh, yeah. well, I wasn't sure if, uh, Nate, you wanted to necessarily read that much sci-fi literature, but I thought that you would probably have a lot of good things to contribute. And, yeah, and I mean, I, I love reading, and I've read a fair amount of sci-fi stuff. Uh, you know, mostly the bigger names like Heinlein, Asimov, Dick, uh, Clark, you know, people like that. But uh, I'm, I'm certainly uh, a big reader, uh, mostly of non-science fiction literature, um, but I also love history. So I'm really excited to dig into the pre-19th century stuff, especially. Yeah, that's perfect. And in fact, that's, I mean, essentially that's how I got to know JM over the uh, Facebook science fiction group. And then I was like, well, I'm, I'm thinking about starting this science fiction, classic science fiction lit podcast. And what do you think? And JM's like, that was a really cool idea. And we just kind of got rolling down the hill that way. And of course, GM is uh, a little bit like the mafia. I I I, I tend to think <laughs> he's connected in all sorts of ways, you know. And uh, so he uh, he was like, "There's a a bunch of people I know." I was like, "All right, that's cool. Let's bring them on. Let's see." So he, he you know he connected with Nate and Ann and you know the rest I'll let him tell. But that's how I got the idea, and that's how I really want to talk about it more because in my real life, most people don't read um, a classic science fiction stuff. They're just that's just not something that they watch. So, so that's the, that's the sort of, um, issue is that, you know, in my real life, the people I talk to, they just, for some reason, don't connect with classic science fiction. So, so anyways, they, they don't, because they don't connect with classic science fiction, I just, you know, I don't really have a venue to talk about it. Right. And so that's the other reason is that you're kind of my sounding boards <laughs> to decompress the things that I read about. Because uh, science fiction is a, a genre of ideas, right? And often, at least for me, once you read it, you want to talk to somebody about it and kind of decompress and kind of figure things out, you know? But uh, anyways, so that's the other reason for me wanting to start a podcast as well, uh, in, in addition to inspiring people to, to read more science fiction and learn more about the genre and history and where it all comes from. So that's that's kind of the... A little bit about me and where I'm where I'm uh, coming from I'm from Boston area and uh, you know work in IT and uh, yeah I love reading science fiction obviously watching and enjoying the rest of the other stuff but the, I really want to expand on my knowledge of the cl classic science fiction lit and that's why I'm here so I'm throwing it to you Jam you want to tell kind of your, your the rest of the story sure as old uh, radio so, host used to say <laughs> <laughs> yes uh... So yeah, my name is JM. I live in Toronto, Canada. Uh, basically, I've been a science fiction fan for a really long time, since pretty much as long as I could remember uh, forming <laughs> forming coherent thoughts about what the future might be. Uh, I can trace it back to uh, watching Doctor Who in 1985 when I was four years old, and I just was randomly channel surfing. And um, I came across this weird 
noisy show and it was really noisy um I should add I should add something that might be of interest to certain listeners anyway is that I'm a non-seeing person so I'm actually a blind guy I uh, don't see anything and I never have in my life so basically when I watch TV it's sound only and when you watch sci-fi shows well the sound design sometimes becomes particularly interesting because uh, the creators have to actually make up sounds for concepts that don't exist yet. And uh, I found that the BBC Radiophonic Workshop really did a lot of interesting things with that show in creating really, really far out soundscapes. So when I was four years old, you know, obviously some concepts were way, way ahead of me that I wasn't able to understand. But just listening to the music and the sound and understanding that some really, really weird stuff was happening it was kind of good enough for me and it grew over time and I actually remember my dad noticing that I was tuning into this show every week and he said to me oh you know maybe you like science fiction well I happen to know of this book by Mark Twain called the Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court and he decided to read me this book I was very very young and I was not definitely not able to take in everything that this book had to offer but there are certain scenes that really stuck with me from that book which was about a 19th century Yankees time travel into uh, the dark ages and being uh, among Arthur and the round table at Camelot and stuff and basically trying to bring them up by their boost bootstraps and introduce them to industrialization uh, destroy the institution of slavery and the charlatanism of magic and Merlin and all that and bring in the new way. And I've actually reread that book about three times. And interestingly enough, I've come away with something slightly different every time. And I think it's been actually really cool that that book's been with me for so long because it's the kind of thing that, you know, you read it when you're 12 and you're like, oh yeah, smash slavery, destroy all the old institutions. And then you know, you read it when you're a romantic in your early 20s and 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 then you really, you know, you read it when you're a disillusioned 30 uh, something and you're all, oh, geez, that's actually really sad, you know, and uh, I like how my per perspective on the book has changed a lot each time I've read it. So it's kind of been with me for a long time. From there, I basically uh, started uh, reading on my own a lot of stuff and I just I know I always had an issue with books and the availability of books. Uh, I read stuff in Braille when I can. I also do listen to audiobooks sometimes, but it's not actually my preferred medium most of the time. Although it does have its advantages because you can kind of, you know, kind of listen on the go while you're doing other stuff and I, I appreciate that. But I uh, do prefer to read stuff by myself and so the availability of books, especially back then, we're talking the late 80s, early 90s now, was, was not very high for me. And I really wanted to read science fiction. And how that basically manifested was that a lot of the stuff that I read was old, even then. So uh, I believe Isaac Asimov was the first author I really spent a lot of time with in the genre, but there was also uh, Jules Verne and H.G. Wells, which uh, who I also spent quite a bit of time with and I think I would say it didn't take me too long to really become a little more acclimatized to the genre and also different uh, writing styles, both, you know, sort of more later 20th century and also earlier stuff. And I think after Asimov, my great discovery after that was probably H.P. Lovecraft, which many would say would, would verge more into the horror genre. But I would say it definitely has a lot of science fiction elements at certain times. And basically looking into a lot of authors from, uh, from decades that were already sort of a little bit uh, past by that time. So I wasn't really reading a lot of contemporary stuff. And even recently I was looking at the oh, uh, Hugo Awards, which for those of you who don't know, that's, that's basically... Uh, award decided by popular vote every year where people pick their uh, favorite 
books in uh, speculative sci-fi genre, I think it verges into fantasy a fair bit, actually, and I'm not quite sure what the criterion is on that, uh, because I know some of the retro awards, especially that they announced lately, um, I mean, T.H. White's Once and Future King actually won the 1939 Hugo, and I don't really know quite how that really fits into science fiction, except that Merlin lives through time backwards. So, um, but anyway, I was looking through that and I noticed that, that basically I'd read all the early ones, basically up to the 80s, and then after that, it's really spotty. So uh, that seems to be the opposite of what most people in uh, my age group have done. And I've been, I've been reading up on this and, and listening to podcasts and talking to people, and it seems like most people go the other way. For me, uh, it's always been the older stuff. So I would say, actually, an interesting thing about the group that we have right now is that each of us sort of has our area that we're really excited about and into. But I think we're all willing to kind of expand our horizons a little bit. And I think that individually, as well as, you know, doing something for listeners, we're, all, we're also going to learn a lot of stuff uh, that we might not otherwise, you know, get to know. And, and I think that's really cool. Uh, as for my personal life experience, I don't, I've, I've never done a podcast before. I do have some broadcasting experience. Uh, I've really, really was into radio in my 20s and did a lot of campus radio stuff, uh, both in front of a microphone and behind the scenes. And I uh, think that I reached a point in my life recently where I felt like I really needed a new thing to uh, concentrate on a little bit. And a lot of people were telling me that I should get into podcasting and I just didn't know what angle I would be taking. And I've always been interested in science fiction, but you know, I just didn't know if this was the angle that I wanted. If, you know, you know I always have this feeling that anything that I want to say has probably already been covered by somebody else. So <laughs> um, I think though that sometimes it just takes a little bit of a push and inspiration and yeah, I was talking to Yi Fang uh, online, and he had this idea, and I thought, hey, that's a great idea. I would like to get involved in that, and that's sort of how we came to do what we did and what we're doing now. Uh, I have a fair bit of experience in literature at large. I, uh, you know, I, I was an English major in school, and I worked in a library for a long time, and read a lot of non science fiction stuff. I, I've kind of gone uh, you know, on and off little periods where I read a lot of science fiction and periods where I didn't read much science fiction, uh, periods where I kind of became, became, became obsessed with certain authors for a while and kind of read everything they did to the exclusion of <laughs> other stuff. So, you know, again, with, with, with a lot of the science fiction stuff, there are certain authors that I've read almost everything they ever wrote that I could get my hands on and other ones that are still considered classics that have barely touched at all. So, because my, my, that this tends to be the way I focus is that I become interested in an artist and what they do. And I try to kind of look into everything that they did as much as possible before kind of branching out to the next thing. So, uh, basically, you know, there, there's been a lot of times where I, I, I felt like my focus was, uh, sort of narrow, I guess. Uh, because I was focusing so much on on a few people that I really liked, and I still do that uh, to this day. So, you know, I've been I've been reading up on stuff a lot more lately and trying to find out about uh, the things that I missed, both in science fiction and and elsewhere that I might have still been interested in. But you know, there's only so much time and so many uh, books you can read. So, and uh, as for other media stuff well you know i i uh, <laughs> i definitely got into a lot of the uh, american sci-fi shows a little later uh, star trek for instance i remember when the first season of star trek next generation came on uh, i already knew a little bit about the original series and it's kind of funny because i didn't realize at quite at first that this was supposed to be a different show and i was very confused I'm like well this is cool but where's captain kirk and bones and stuff um but uh, yeah, I, I figured it out. I figured it out. I, I think it was seven or eight when that series started, and I had an older cousin that was into a lot of the more mainstream science fiction stuff because, you know, uh, 
back in that back in that time, uh, Doctor Who wasn't considered cool. It's considered cool now because it's a new flashy series that people like. But back in the eighties and early nineties, you, know, you weren't really, uh, you know, you weren't really cool if you liked it, so to speak. And I didn't really have anybody to talk about it with. But my cousin was really into Star Wars and Star Trek. Actually, the first science fiction movie that I ever remember seeing was The Black Hole, the Disney movie, the the one that's um, the live-action Disney movie from 1979. And again, it's a movie that's not very well loved, generally, but for some reason my cousin really liked that movie, and we watched it together, and I think my dad showed me uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey not long after that, and I watched that with him and his stoner friend uh, in the latter's apartment where we uh, also watched a lot of other films and you know that that was pretty cool and i got exposed to a lot of that kind of stuff through people like that and also through the versions for kids that came out in the 80s where you could actually play a record and read along in a book at least that was the idea i usually didn't have the book but i just had the record so you put on the record and it was a very very condensed version of a popular story like one of the star wars movies or indeed 2001 or the black hole they all had them raiders of the lost ark had one uh and these were really popular back then they were really short really condensed and they had uh, both narration and really loud bombastic sound design and you know, it was it was pretty great for kids sort of trying to get into stuff, I guess. And I think I actually listened to the Star Wars one more often than I actually watched the Star Wars movie because I never had a VCR in my house growing up. So uh, movies were basically whatever you caught on TV or whatever was playing in the theater. So it was a very very different time back then. But that's uh, that's basically my history with science fiction, I guess. Uh, I have my favorite authors that many of which we probably won't even discuss on this program unless we really get into personal stuff because a lot of them are not necessarily what a lot of people would consider seminal. They're just writers that I happen to really, really like for whatever reason, usually because I'm a fan of style and I like it when a writer has style. That's that's sort of the thing that leaps out to me first and foremost. So uh, that's that's sort of what I look for in good writing anyway. So whether it's science fiction or not, and uh, I'm sure we'll get on to more of that stuff as as we progress. So, uh, yeah, why don't uh, Anna or Nate, you take it away now. Well, I think I'm done. JM, traveling. why don't you take us through how you found uh, or how you knew how you because I part of my explanation is that I kind of uh, talk about how a little bit of my background, but how how I also got connected to you through the Facebook oh, yeah. uh, science fiction. Okay, and yeah, then, well, so your 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 next thing would be to. Uh, take us through how you you got to know Nate and Anne and all that sure. stuff, and then they can take they can do the next. Uh, well, um, so Anne and I actually met on the same uh, online group that Ifang and I met on, but uh, this was quite some time ago. I think back in 2018, and uh, I think it started because she posted a topic about H.P. Lovecraft, or somehow the topic of H.P. Lovecraft came up, and. You know, it was it was one of those uh, talks about mysterious angles and strange otherworldly geometries that just sort of gets me going. And uh, we started talking about that. I think uh, some the, the you know the group itself. I think that it's not a great you know the, the discussion in the group isn't always awesome, but it's actually been all right for connecting with people that have similar interests. And uh, so we've been you know we've been talking for for a couple of years. And, uh, and yeah, it's been good because I thought, you know, we, we, we need a fourth host. We want somebody, uh, we want as many perspectives as possible. And I think that, uh, I just thought of her right away and I'm like, yeah, let's, let's make this connection and make this happen. Uh, Nate, I've known Nate since, uh, early days on IRC, uh, on the internet back in the late nineties, we were, uh, um, oh, I love IRC. It, it, yeah, yeah, Throwback. it's still the still the greatest uh, chat platform out there, and the most still around, technically. <laughs> it's still around. Yeah, yeah. of course, because it's never it never really has to go anywhere as long as people are willing to put up servers, right? So, yep. Um, and uh, yeah, we were well, uh, we were talking in a heavy metal chat group, and uh, actually, we had a mutual friend. I think before that, uh, 
who lived in Pennsylvania, and I think that he probably sort of connected us because I think those two knew each other first. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we had our own channel that we kind of put up on one of the networks, and and we just hang out in that channel and talk about whatever the hell we wanted and stuff. And um, um, later on, you know, we kind of uh, I think I, I didn't use IRC so much, and and things kind of moved on in life. But we kind of kept in touch, and I had a band going for a really long time. Uh, which is just sort of recently broken up, and that's kind of one of the things that left me at a point in my life where I felt like I really needed new stuff to sort of concentrate on that I enjoyed. And uh, Nate, Nate's seen my band several times, and we met at we met at shows uh, around different parts of uh, you know Central Eastern Canada and the United States and stuff. Uh, when my band Great played, band, in... by the way. Great band. <laughs> oh well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I always yeah. enjoyed you guys. Well, thanks. I did too, but that chapter is done. So yeah, yeah. Um, that's uh, but yeah, it's it's cool because you know we it kind of even though we kind of moved on with our our things and uh, uh, I got um, married for a while and and I think Nate recently got married, right? Didn't you? Uh, three years. Fairly ago. recently, three years. Yeah. Yep. Cool. And yeah, you know, we, we kind of started doing our, our own things, but we still kind of kept in touch. And every so often we'd meet over music and stuff. And, uh, you know, so yeah, that's that's pretty much we how we all came together. Uh, none of us live in the same place, but we're all buddies. So it's, it's worked out really well because we're kind of at, uh, at a point right now. Uh, we're recording this in early May 2020. And... Isolation seems to be the name of the game right now for a lot of us. <laughs> so we don't have so, anything else to do, John. Yeah, well, you know, we're spending. <laughs> we're, we're. I don't know. I mean, I always, I always felt fairly comfortable with talking to people online, and now it seems like everybody's doing it, and it's become normal. It's become really normalized now. Uh, I mean, it was already heading that way anyway, but in the last couple of months. Uh, it just seems like people people that I normally would go to parties with are now just chatting with their buddies on Skype. So it's really strange. <laughs> but that's that's just the way it's happened now. It's like a parallel universe. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. There definitely is. So Nate or Anne, do you want to kind of take the ball and keep running? I with, can go. Uh, um, well, I met John because of the sci-fi group. I didn't end up liking the sci-fi group too much um it was interesting but not interesting enough and um but john was interesting so him and i started talking and we've been buddies for a few years now um lots of conversations talking about just this subject um many wasted saturdays as i say but i i personally have always had a relationship with science fiction um I, it started for me really early on with my mom my mom watched soap operas or sci-fi. Really funny. Mm. I was five years old and there was two choices. All my children or Doctor Who. And so what am I going to sit through? Her folding laundry through all my children or her folding laundry through Doctor Who? And, and <laughs> this is the fourth Doctor, mind you. So early 80s, late 70s. Um, and Star Trek and all that. And, and so I really liked science fiction as, as a visual. Um, and then um, I didn't actually start reading science fiction so much. Um, I'm a horror fan. So I started reading horror and mystery. I was like the little kid with the black outfit, with the cape, reading all of the scary stuff. And I didn't really get into sci-fi until I was about 11 or 12, and I found H.P. Lovecraft. And my dad gave me a book of H.P. Lovecraft short stories when I was 12, right before junior high. And um, I spent the entire summer reading that. And from that, I guess, there were certain stories that I liked best. And the ones that I found that I liked the best were the ones that had something that was plausible. He was fantastic. Oh, sure. You know, all these different creatures and all these different things. But anytime they mentioned anthropology or biology or physics, I was like, yes, because those are real things. And so um, that's how I started to like sci-fi novels. And, and um, 
my love of mystery and horror led into the HP Lovecraft when I was a little kid. And then from there, it, it that was actually what moved me into science fiction literature. And um, my dad was weird. So every summer he used to make me read from the Harvard classics. So I did read Connecticut Yankee. I read Frankenstein. I read H.G. Wells. I read Verne. I mean, at a very young age, um, every summer, summer begrudgingly, this is the book you're forcing me to read. But it wasn't until that H.P. Lovecraft moment where I was like, sci-fi is fun. It's like Doctor Who during laundry time. It's like horror. Just like all the creepy stuff I watch. Big zombie fan. But it has this moment of plausibility into it. So that is where I got my love of science fiction. Was from TV to that horror to then transitioning into science fiction from a horror slash science fiction writer. And there's that romanticism about sci-fi that people don't really look at. It's like technology, it's robots, but realistically it's romantic. It is like the Gothic, Gothic novels. It's like the oddity or the, the Homer and it's like the Iliad. It's like all those things, but the biggest difference is that there's this plausibility factor that resonated with me as a young adult and as a teenager. And I, like many of you, have a wheelhouse. And when I got my first Philip K. Dick book, when I was 14 years old, I was done. I was sold. New Wave all the way. I read everything. Everything. I've even read his exegesis. Exegesis, which is like a thousand pages. Um, and, and that's where that is for me. So, yeah, that's me in sci-fi. Nate, go ahead, take it away. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, well, I've been in your Facebook group for a couple months now, and you know, I really appreciate the body of knowledge that you, know, you guys bring to the table on science fiction and, and horror film. So yeah. I have okay. an offbeat B-movie and film uh, cult grindhouse um, Facebook group that I started. Um, I had John join in, too, because I couldn't do it by myself. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I'm always glad to hear <laughs> that it's okay, but go ahead. I have an off, offbeat movie group. Is it kind of like the uh, Tarantino Grindhouse type esque? No, it's genre? more horror. actually horror. Science fiction. Science fiction. It's everything. I, I'm so into everything collectively and how they thread together. But you know what I'm I've talking actually, about, right? The Tarantino yeah. Grindhouse. And, it. Uh, it I post a lot of Grindhouse. I post a lot of sci-fi. My initial inspiration was old school 1950s B-movies, like giant creature features or the kaiju with Godzilla. That's what made me do it. The flying saucer men, you know, bee women from Venus, cat women from the moon. That Ooh, yeah. kind of stuff is what really <laughs> inspired me. Because it's so silly and it's so fantastic, and there's this grain of humanity within every single crappy film. Um, so that's what made me start it, and I post everything that uh, is a little weird. Yeah, it's yeah, actually I think quite a uh, uh, little weird stuff. You know, is going to map to the literature nicely because the early stuff, especially. Uh, you know, enlightenment and pre-enlightenment gets really wacky at times. Like some of the stuff I've read really go to some strange places, both literally and, and figuratively. Um, but I've always been into science fiction uh, in general and cult film and, and horror and things like that. Uh, I was a big reader as a kid, but uh, kind of fell off in middle school um, when I mostly got into underground music, like heavy metal, uh, hardcore and things like that, which uh, took up most of my time in high school. And really, the only thing I read during that time in college was Lovecraft, because uh, it's kind of hard to be a metal fan and you know miss the works of Lovecraft. Pretty much. <laughs> I, I mean, if you were to do a search of every Lovecraft reference in metal, uh, it would be in the thousands, uh, I would guess. Um, so uh, a lot of the big bands talked about that. Uh, Morbid Angel, 
um, in particular was, was one that I really listened to a lot. Uh, but I really started reading serious stuff uh, beyond uh, just Lovecraft in college, um, where I got into 19th century uh, literature, um, the Russian stuff in particular, I, I got really into it, Dostoevsky, uh, Tolstoy, uh, Lermontov, and things like that. Um, and as I have a tendency to do everything on a budget, uh, most of my book collection came from reading thrift stores, used bookstores, and things like that, where I could buy books for 25 cents, 50 cents a piece, and those pretty much ended up always being classic literature for pa paperbacks. Um, and I figure if the books survive for three or four hundred years, uh, it's probably for a reason. Um, so I've yeah. read a good chunk of books from the uh, 18th and 19th century, uh, early 20th century. Um, my favorite authors there, um, aside from the aforementioned Russian ones, uh, Dickens, uh, Joyce, Proust, Faulkner, um, stuff like that. But uh, science fiction's kind of always been in the hopper um, as far as that goes. So I, I've read a lot of the more common big authors like uh, Heinlein, Philip K. Dick, uh, Asimov, um, Dune series, um, and yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to go on this voyage um, through the history of science fiction literature because I, I really do love all aspects uh, coming from the science fiction genre angle and uh, the literature side as well as the history piece. Yeah, um, I'm glad that I'm glad that you're into doing this this much because you know at first when I was asking you I was kind of thinking because I uh, we're both Nate and I are both on Goodreads uh, which is a site where you can kind of oh, I'm on Goodreads too you're on Goodreads too I didn't know that me too okay now I know start a group <laughs> there you go yeah yeah, yeah. yeah no, okay. we definitely should because this is literature and uh, yeah you know, it, it'd be good to see Act what everybody else is I was actually gonna yeah. ask Nate okay so as far as sci-fi and um, Gosh, you just mentioned his name, train of thought. Um, as I lay dying, Faulkner. Yeah. That's my oh, favorite. Yeah. That's one of my favorite books ever. And um, oh, Faulkner's so good. I've read almost all of. Am stuff. I yeah, wrong he's, he's thinking that as I lay dying might actually kind of go into that sci-fi genre in the speaking for the dead? In a sense, in uh, it, it's in, very in Southern Gothic. So, I mean, there's kind of overlaps and themes with, like, science fiction and Gothic and, and horror in general. Uh, there's definitely a lot of weird, a lot of weirdness, that's for sure. Yeah, Faulkner goes <laughs> in some really dark places, uh, yeah. especially because he explores the themes of poverty a lot, yeah. especially Southern poverty. Um, so it, it definitely gets into that supernatural religious element. Um, and it's often told from the perspective of, uh, well, there, there's quite a few mentally disabled characters, uh, so it gets processed in, in different ways through the text. Um, and he has a reputation for being a very difficult read for that reason. Um, but I think, like, in As I Lay Dying, if we're looking at cyberpunk, and cyberpunk really has this, it's, it's the newest sci-fi, everyone knows that. Cyberpunk, you know, coming after Philip K. Dick, really goes into this dis dif difference the disparate reality between the impoverished with high technology. And I think that in some ways that is exemplified in, in some of Faulkner's work. Oh, absolutely. Uh, a big theme in his work is the introduction of the automobile and how that changes rural Mississippi life. There you go. Mm -hmm. That's important. Yeah, I, I actually haven't read uh, any Faulkner novels yet, but I have read a lot of short stories. I have a big collected uh, short fiction of Faulkner book, and I actually really love that book, but for some reason, I just haven't yet gotten around to Read reading it. Read As I Lay Dying. It's, it's phenomenal. It's uh, a really, yeah, I, for me, it's, it's, it's my favorite of his. I'll definitely, yeah, I'll definitely like put that, that. That I would really strongly recommend. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've definitely, I've definitely meant to tackle those for, for quite some time now, so... But uh, but what I what I was initially going to say was that uh, Nate, you and I are both on Goodreads, and we both have a, a number of reviews up there. I don't know if you've done any lately, but uh, you know I, I saw a lot of what you wrote, and yeah, I, I laughed at a lot of your reviews of classic science fiction literature, so called, because you know it was very uh, very to the point and kind of like a little bit yeah, this guy can't write, you know, yeah, kind I mean, of thing. Most of the time, and, shit, and you know you realize that pretty. Outside the big games, <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah, and, uh, and you know, but, uh, yeah. I mean, I don't really do thought-out reviews. I'd say I, after I finish a book, I always just 
throw my thoughts up there and They're it's kind of more of a reference for me to go back to. Right. And I, I kind of realize now, you know, a lot of what you were saying, like, it wasn't necessarily that you didn't like the story per se. It was more that you would judge things based upon their literary merit, which makes sense because it's a site dedicated towards you know, people that read. And yeah. I, I tend to try and look at things that way as well. But I, I would be the first to admit that there are a few things that I really like. That maybe are not all that well written. Like, that's uh, the well, green assault you have to take with science fiction, is that with as cool as some of the innovative thoughts are and the concepts and themes, what happens is there's a little cheesiness to it, and I think we kind of like the cheese, or we take that with a grain of salt, <laughs> and then we go with it because there's a concept that is irrefutably the reason why we read it. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. I, I think my scale for judging a book is how much I enjoy the read, not necessarily, um, you know, how, how great it is on uh, artistic oh, yeah. merit. And there, there are some people who are, you know, cheesy and pulpy, but like, I really like their writing. Like Stephen King is really good at what he does, um, in, in, in some aspects anyway. Um, and oh, yeah. I, I have a lot of fun reading some of his books, but I wouldn't put him on the same level as like, you know, Joyce. Uh, no, no. But <laughs> somebody like, uh, you know, Vonnegut, I just can't stand his style. Uh, well, so in the book, <laughs> I, I'm jokes. like a huge Vonnegut fan, but there's yeah. a few of his books I cannot stand, and yeah. I wish they would Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit 455. Why? Fahrenheit 450 won them. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. There's a certain one. Yeah. Bradbury's um, one that, that I think is also really well done, even though his style is a bit pulpy at times. He can tell a really good story, and, and he has cool atmosphere. Yeah. Uh, yeah, one author that, I mean, I, I definitely think that uh, this comes to mind, and I don't know if we'll actually even get to talk about this, but if we, you know, if we decide, we haven't yet decided how, how many of these we're going to do, but uh, there was a writer, uh, A.E. Van Vogt, who started writing in the 30s, and I find him to be one of the weirdest uh, kind of like pulp golden age sci-fi writers in the sense that he just threw everything, including the kitchen sink, at you, and you never knew exactly where he was where he was going until he got there. And I consider him, you know, sort of a precursor to the Philip K. Dick kind of almost style of sci-fi writing, where where the reader kind of has to pause every so often, and go, "What kind of drugs is this guy taking?" <laughs> um, and you know, he's not a good writer in a lot of senses. Sometimes it's a bit clunky. Sometimes you know, it's like you kind of feel like you, you have to reread something a couple of times because it just doesn't seem to flow from one thought to the next. But so once you get really into the style, it actually works. And it's an individual thing. You know, uh, I, I read a lot of commentary on Goodreads and elsewhere. Or, you know, people can't stand it. Uh, but there's probably something else that they like that I feel the same way about. You know, it's like, oh, this is trash. And I can't even relate to it at all, right? Yeah, I did not and, care for uh, Voyage of the Space Beagle, but maybe I'll have to check out some of his other works. Yeah, oh yeah, that's, and that's, that's uh, even, uh, I was talking to one of my friends about this today, and he, uh, he keeps, I don't know, I guess he's, he really likes, I don't think he's read a lot of his stuff, but he really likes that Space Beagle, and he really likes <laughs> the fact that uh, he seems to think, you know, as both an influence on Star Trek and Alien, and, Maybe he's you know, right. Yeah, alien for <laughs> yeah, sure. Like, but alien, so the alien yeah. is like this cat predator, and he used the word pussy like fifty times. In <laughs> <laughs> it's like, come on, man. Oh, that dangerous pussy. Well, yeah. for some people who don't know, though, there, like just to contextualize for people listening that aren't familiar, there are about five different eras in science fiction literature. You have like the Victorian era. You have the proto Shelley. You've got the Shelley and the Wells and the Verne. Then you have the pulpy magazines. Then you have the Golden Age that comes from the 30s to the 50s or 60s. Then you have the New Wave. And the New Wave is all your Burroughs, Vonnegut, Dick books. And then you have Cyberpunk, which came out of Dick and into, I'm saying that like he came on the scene. Um, that was a joke. Um, and then there's the cyberpunk. So that's, those are like some major eras in science fiction literature that we'll be talking about, I assume. Yeah. Is that, 
is that is there another era after that i don't quite really so far not so much are we still technically in the cyberpunk I, what do I'm you even call the current science fiction? i'm gonna it's say it's been a thing for what 40 years yeah, it's, uh, yeah it's been since 1980 about until now so we're we're looking at post philip k dick is it it's gibson when, or kind of the um, oh, a big William, yes yeah so so yeah. so so philip k is the sort of the predecessor of setting He's things kind of the led stage. into it because he actually looked at everything with this digital reality this non-reality reality this you know matrix you know it, it to, to think of something that i can relate it to people who don't read it is the matrix is a good example the digital that's perfect era. for me because I, I honestly i'm going to be the audience surrogate <laughs> All right. so, as you guys are chatting so, on that's your job now that's my job i, yeah. I seriously like i i want to read ask all these the things questions you guys are we're going to answer them because so i will be the audience fans. surrogate absolutely i i am almost like an audience just listening in i'm like wow this is interesting i'm asking you a bunch of questions <laughs> i just want to provide because i am a teacher so i like to provide the context and that you know if you're going to learn from it you might as well know what it is yes that's how it progressed throughout history is like you have your fantasy and all the gods and religions and then all of a sudden science happened and then science happened and everything starts happening because of science and we also had the industrial revolution so everything starts to turn inward what we're doing and science becomes bigger than god that's our mad scientist with hubris and all this and then it starts to go into these other realms but science fiction does one thing it works within the realms of what is plausible or or in the context of society what we know can happen and i think that's why it makes it so important correct me if i'm wrong so it looks like we're moving on to the main feature discussion which so is what is before we do that i'd just like to back up for one second and address something uh, and this is something that I want to talk about a little bit, uh, the concept of genre, because we uh, we were kind of asking the question and just sort of glossed over it. Has I there been anything? Good. Has there been anything since the new wave? Um, now, as somebody who has worked on a music genre database and uh, has spent a good bit of time with it, there's something that I have to observe, and that is that. Genre is really only a thing as much as you want it to be a thing. I mean, basically, when these things start out, they're not codified till many years after the fact. So, I mean, now we can talk about how there was a golden age. Now we can talk about a new wave. But they never called it the golden age during the golden age. It's considered that way after the fact. And so the fact that we can say, well, there hasn't really been too much significant new coinage since cyberpunk i don't think that's particularly significant i think that uh as that's where things, we're at now yeah but i think i think that as things become uh, solidified over time you have something that's basically all right we don't need a new you know we don't need a new term we don't need new words what we need to do is focus on what we have now and you know maybe not as a collective but as individuals improve upon it so I, I don't actually know if, you know, maybe 50 years from now, literary historians will say, oh, you know, the 2010s was the period of <laughs> this in science fiction. And, um, you know, this, this is uh, something that that's, I don't know that we're ever going to cover in this podcast because uh, sci-fi in the 2010s is mostly outside of my purview right now, but I'm open-minded to it. Uh, you know, there's a couple of TV series that I'm sort of familiar with, but I can't say that I've read a lot from the last few years, except for maybe some Neil Stevenson and um, maybe one or two other authors, which I didn't actually like very much. And that's on me. But, you know, there there are probably things that I could discover that are awesome. Uh, you know, Alistair Reynolds is pretty cool, but he's kind of like old school space opera. You know, he's really not new conceptually, but he does this merging of really epic space opera with some horror motifs like some almost lovecraftian ideas and so on and uh i don't know i mean ian banks i guess is fairly new uh it's just i feel like 
after a certain point, and, and you know, people complain about this in the metal genre, which is something that I'm sort of familiar with, there's like, there's nothing new under the sun. What they really mean is there's no exciting new buzzwords to throw around. Like, this is a new genre. <laughs> and I think that I think that if you become too focused on that, you're kind of lose you lose sight of what's really important. It's not to name a new thing. So, I mean, the fact that there is, hasn't really been any significant development since cyberpunk in the 80s doesn't necessarily mean that science fiction is doing badly. Now, uh, if we have listeners that will comment on that and maybe say that I'm wrong, that there actually have been a lot of new developments, I'd be perfectly willing to listen. And I'm sure we all would. But uh, I, I honestly yeah, don't and, feel like that's uh, too important. In, in regards to contemporary genres, I think what history does and has always done is it uses the past to talk about the present. Uh, so yeah. as we go through the historical literature, I'm sure we're going to bring up uh, more contemporary genres and how these works have influenced the genre going forward beyond you know the works that we're actually covering. But I'm, I'm sure we're going to be discussing a lot of this going forward. Yes. I agree. And you, Ifang, I think you were going to lead us in, in a new yeah. direction. And, and I was just like, hang on a second. Back up. Back up. We, we, we didn't talk about this thing that was brought up. And I want to talk about it. So no, uh, it's all part go of ahead. It. No, it's absolutely. <laughs> I, I think you, you, you're right on the dot. Uh, I was going to actually go there, too. But uh, you kind of beat me to the punch. But, you know, what you're saying is correct, is that uh, a lot of it's kind of when we look back upon history we give it labels we give it periods of times but the people that were living through the history nobody gives it those labels you know like you know like we're living through some pandemic 2020 well i don't know how history is going to classify this you know at the time of our recording here it may be a completely different yeah it, it could be a whole host <laughs> of different names who knows what it is you know and uh um so that's the fascinating part is that you've got, you know, these are labels that has been bestowed upon it um, largely as uh, a study or retrospective and from academic perspectives and maybe just popular culture as well. A mixture of both. And uh, yeah, definitely keep that in mind for sure. Because as we start diving into it, I mean, that's where it kind of all is going to be, you know, all, all pulled apart as it were you know like trying to define science fiction what what is the difference between that versus speculative fiction versus i mean there's so many terms that get addressed is how to how to define science fiction so i mean you know i, I don't know do you guys have any initial overview thoughts about what it means to to be belonging to this genre of science fiction I as a you. you know retrospective I do, Go ahead. actually. I'm really opinionated about this. Sorry, guys. I'm really opinionated <laughs> about <laughs> where my lines lie as, in terms of science fiction as a literary genre. And I think I've stated it before, but it's in Shelley's work. It's the first paragraph of her, her novel, Frankenstein, that really defines it for me. And, and it's what I've said before, which was... This isn't a real story. This is pretend. This is make-believe. But it could happen. It didn't. It's not real, but it could. And for me, what defines science fiction, apart from horror or fantasy or gods and goddesses and Homer-esque literature, really comes down to the plausibility and I think that the plausibility is denoted by context of time and space that we are currently in. We have a set of technological tools at our ready, but sci-fi just pushes it a little bit, but works within the realms and parameters of what could happen. And there's some other things for me that define it. But that's where I hold my line, is, is this a plausibility? And space travel, we know it's a plausibility. We went to the moon. Um, inter with how we're connecting now, this is a plausibility. And how it's going to move and how it's going to change and how it's going to affect us as human beings and how it's going to 
alter our states of reality. And I think for me, that's where my line is drawn. Anyone else? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think human agency in the story is yes. a big part of it. Uh, so, I mean, before Shelley, you really had space travel framed as either uh, religiously inspired or as a philosophical allegory. It wasn't somebody creating a device that does something that is not possible at, at the period of time in that kind of speculation solely through the actions of a human. Um, and I, I think that's what really shifts it from fantasy, from horror, from the gothic fiction of the time, which does have certain elements of the supernatural um, and other areas of speculative fiction, but it doesn't really make it science fiction. It's the science of it. So I basically was trying to talk about my idea of science fiction and what it means. And I was saying that I think that I might have a looser, somewhat looser definition than you guys in the sense that uh, I feel like I don't have enough scientific background to really say definitively what might be plausible. And I have a pretty high suspension of disbelief threshold just because uh, it, it wasn't so much the case when I was younger. But as I got older, I actually started to read more fantasy and just because, you know, um, I got out of my, oh, God, the entire thing is just people trying to ape Tolkien and doing it really badly face because I discovered there was actually more to it than that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot more to it if you want to look beyond all the mass market paperbacks and stuff that are, you know, right. But, uh, well, yeah, yeah, and that was one of the that things. That blew my that mind did... this year, I have to say. That that easily shot up into my top five books ever. Yeah, I love it. I love Gorman Ghost. It's, 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 uh, it's actually uh, it's the, the Gorman Ghost trilogy by Marvin Peake. Uh, I it's just kind that. of... Yeah, it's it's really good. It's definitely beyond the scope of our podcast, mostly. But although the third book actually does suddenly and very surprisingly turn post-apocalyptic sci-fi kind of, but um, it, it, you know, it's this kind of big epic story about the denizens of this castle bound by ritual and uh, this ancient edifice. And it's really well written. It reminds me of Dickens. So I'm yeah, not really surprised Dickens. that. Yeah, I'm not surprised that Nate likes it a lot. Uh, um, but I think that I, I was actually talking about the science fiction course that I took in any university and this was sort of a, I, I used this in a way as a springboard for some ideas about how we could tackle this podcast because what they did, you know, what the professor did in that course was that half of it was basically concentrated on science and on developments and we went basically chronologically, which is kind of what we're going to do with this podcast so far. We might change that format as things go on, but we'll see how that goes. But um, the second half was basically concentrated on stories that were influenced by or centered around whatever scientific developments we were discussing in the first half. So they weren't necessarily things that were written during those time periods, but they were they were something that dealt with that. So uh, I don't actually remember us reading much pre-Shelley literature during that course but we definitely talked about stuff that was you know enlightenment period 1600s and so on and um i feel like that professor was very influenced by harlan ellison and his ideas of uh I, I, this is something that i read a little bit about recently uh, i don't know the full story but i guess you know some of the old school science fiction writers which i guess could include ellison you know i mean he's not that old school but he started in the 50s so you know, he was around for a bit, and he uh, basically made a distinction between science fiction and sci-fi. And his idea was that sci-fi was basically the mainstream Hollywood movies, uh, kind of, geez, robots and spaceships kind of stuff. And science fiction was the more intellectual side of the, the, the genre. And to me, I mean, you know, there's obviously areas where those things intersect i think naturally as you become older you start to wonder more about the intellectual side of things and you start to wonder what are the consequences of all those robots and spaceships what happens to people living on the frontiers if we develop you know space flight faster than light travel and all that what happens to the underclass what happens 
if robots become somewhat sentient, uh, all those things are things that we start to wonder about as we get past the wow robots and spaceship space, which is definitely how I sort of got into science fiction was through that. Uh, you know, I wanted everything to be robots and spaceships. If I read something that was boring, I could just add robots and spaceships to it and it would instantly <laughs> be better, right? Uh, I'm sure I'm not the only one. So, you know, but um, I do feel like when I first read about Clark's so-called law, which basically says, you know, any uh, technology sufficiently advanced might be indistinguishable from magic, at least from a certain perspective, which isn't exactly how he phrased it, but that's kind of how I see it. Uh, it meant something to me, and I and what it meant to me is that you could you could transpose a lot of things into a science fictional context if you wanted to, and I think that uh, I thought when I first read that as a thirteen or fourteen year old or something, I thought that was really cool because I thought you know okay so we can go back to stories of antiquity and we could say hey we don't know how to explain any of this stuff other than to say that God did it but. You know, maybe later on there might be other ways to explain it that might be really cool and interesting, even if it's not true. You know, I mean, it might be cool to see it that way. And so that became one of my big things in high school was taking old stories and kind of transposing them into a science fictional context. And I found that you could really easily do it. And I think that some modern authors definitely saw the same thing. And I think that actually um, one older author who we'll probably discuss during the Golden Age time period if we get there, uh, who did that was John W. Campbell, because I think that he was actually really interested in that, and he seems to have done that with some of the old uh, Norse stories and stuff, because he, he wrote a book that was kind of about that, it was, uh, called The Cloak of Isera, I think. And um, I don't know, I just it's just one of those things, I always feel like genre boundaries are a little bit permeable, I'm not, you know, I'm never going to get too upset if somebody claims that something is science fiction and I don't really see it that way because to me it's just interesting, you know, it's not like, I, I don't, I take science fiction seriously enough but I'm not, you know, I'm not a genre purist, I guess, uh, and that goes for how I see music as well because that's always been one of my things, so, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to get, I just, I just find it interesting that people have different perspectives about this. So I'm not, uh, my idea of what science fiction might be is sort of permeable, but I, uh, I do think there's some basic definitions that most of us can probably agree on, like science fiction, and this is something that I saw recently, uh, is that science fiction is basically uh, human civilization or individuals and their response to change or their response to the presence of something new. Uh, and that could be something very soci sociological, it could be something biological, uh, it could be technological. Uh, some people definitely want there to be a lot of hard science. Uh, I suspect particularly people with a science background are interested in this aspect of things. I'm interested in it, but to a point only, because I don't really have the background to sit there and read uh, pages and pages of what basically amounts to somebody trying to explain how something might be possible through scientific means. I mean, sometimes it's interesting, but uh, I guess I'm sort of not not generally too inclined that way unless the writing style is really capturing me. So uh, I, I kind of feel like we can sort of move on now to, to talking about our individual definitions of what science fiction is. I think that, that it could be speculation about the future. It could be, I, I like the, the idea of it being basically our response to some something new and something basically that represents a change that we might hypothesize or we might- I'm gonna make a little visual for you that, yeah. that's like similar. The There's a scene in 2001, the Space Odyssey film where there's like the monolith and we already know about Hal and Dave and there's this weird cut to like the apes banging their sticks yeah. <laughs> around a giant monolith and if you're gonna say anything 
that's what it is. I mean, re regardless of what the change is, everything that's forward thinking is a change. Everything that we do, yes. whether it's from creating a fork or a pen or a paper, it doesn't matter. We have to respond to it. And I think science fiction works within the realms of understanding ourselves in a new context because we're not only scared, it's going to ultimately change us. And, and, and so I think, sorry if I overstepped, but that's where I think you're going with that. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think that's also why whenever you look at things discussing the history of science fiction that want to go really deep, they start out with something really broad. And you go, is that really science fiction? Is the Epic of Gilgamesh, like, why are we considering that science fiction? And, okay, we don't exactly, but you can see how somebody thinking about that in the broadest definition of science fiction and saying exactly what you've just said, uh, you know, that it's that change or that, that you know, responding to some, uh, some great upheaval or change could apply there. And even to the original ideas about the floods and so on because every mythology seems to have a flood story pretty much why is that what you know what is it that happened were they thinking ahead or were they thinking of the past there was a you know, flood and, and then a bunch of other people talked about it yeah yeah that then that seems pretty straightforward but you know there seems to have been agency behind that there seems to have been something you know something that directed it and of course in ancient times you know it was always the gods it was always those spiritual superiors that we spent but so much time trying to understand that's where sci-fi takes its notes no longer is it about the gods we're the ones making the changes and the reality comes where we have to deal with the consequences of the changes that are not only around us because of our choices but because of how we're changing in the context of a society and that's where sci-fi takes off. Yeah, I, I think the big pivot is really with Copernicus and the Enlightenment. Because um, before that, a lot of it is tied to religion, whether it be ancient Babylonian, ancient Greek, ancient Hindu, uh, or Christianity uh, throughout the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. But when we discovered that the Earth wasn't the center of the universe, it really shifts how the human mind thinks about human importance in the scale of things. Um, and that kind of leads to a different shift in just thinking in general. Um, yep. And I, I think after that is really where you see more human agency take place rather right. than the actions of various supernatural deities or um, using uh, what might be considered precursors to tropes like alien worlds or moon explorations as explorations of uh, philosophical discourses, um, but rather incorporate human agency and creation and speculation into the plot. Yeah, I think there's, there's a little bit of irony in that too, in that in our understanding that in the cosmic scale of things we're actually quite small, also the sense of human agency increased. I don't know. I mean, that's that's kind of an interesting dichotomy there, I think, a little Did bit. Did you read The Moat in God's Eye? Because that, that's a real good yeah. play on that one. I actually yeah. didn't. I actually didn't read that. I would recommend it. I thought it was decent. Yep. I, Just I've to read that, a that of... concept. Yeah, it's uh, a first contact story. Um, and it's a little too military-ish kind of for my taste. But it does <laughs> have some really too. cool ideas. Yeah. Um, this is cool because we all have our, our strong opinions about some of this stuff. Um, I'll, I'll say right now that I hate the book Ender's Game, and I'm not going to make too many friends by saying this, I'm sure. You I'm know what? I'm not like... happy with you. <laughs> Poke your eyes out. Jesus. I read that a lot when I was a kid, well, but I yeah, don't think My daughter's middle name, name is Valentine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Maybe, maybe we'll cover that another time. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I just was talking about military sci-fi and, and first contact and all that. I just thought of how we all have our preferences and styles and so on. And that, that book just did not appeal to me at that time. Now, maybe if I'd read it 
10 years earlier, I would have felt differently. But in my early 20s, it was I found a very unappealing book. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, so so that's interesting that the, the moat in God's eye is something that I should definitely look into because I've, I've heard about it. But it's uh, Larry Niven and some other guy whose name I'm forgetting at the moment. Jerry um, Purnell, I believe. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, um, uh, yeah Niven, Niven has a definitely pulpy style. Um, and, and that book is no exception, but it's enjoyable for what it is, for sure. So is that, is that you, you thought of that because of the, uh, or Anne thought of that because of the... The infinitely um, big, the infinitely small. And the infinitely the small, one. yeah. Yeah, the infinitely small. Right. It's, it's, it's the microcosm within the macrocosm, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah, I, I just thought of that because of, of Nate's, uh, Nate's thought process there and talking about um, how, how we started to perceive our position in the cosmos so differently. And, and some people would be like, oh, man, we're so infinitesimally small. That's really overwhelming and crappy. Uh, <laughs> and other people would think, no, it's not. You know, it just means something different. We have to, we have to start seeing the universe differently and, and changing our perspective. And, uh, you know, I just thought that was an interesting dichotomy that I wanted to point out there. But I don't know exactly where I was going with that, if anywhere, but. Just, it, just, uh, it was just we were, a point of interest. <laughs> I think you were talking about just uh, defining science fiction, which I think we all have started to do anyways. Um, yes. But uh, it, to me, it sounds like you're closer to... I haven't read this guy, but he's a... Com a lot of people have had... There's a whole Wikipedia list of uh, famous science fiction authors and how they define science fiction. <laughs> which is just yes. goes to show you how complicated even defining science fiction is but oh certainly yeah it's just called definitions of science fiction it's a list of and here's his his wording uh darko suvin who's a i think croatian in 1979 he wrote science fiction is distinguished by the narrative dominance of or hegemony of a fictional novum or novelty oh, yeah. innovation value i saw that cognitive too logic yeah. right right and uh yeah i pretty much said that novel basically means new so and that's that's <laughs> trying to put some fancy very, words. Very simple. Trying to put some fancy words in your mouth. It's all. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it sounds fancy, but it's actually really, really simple definition. Right. Like really simple. Simple but which complicated. Is cool. <laughs> yeah, but... <laughs> I personally uh, like Asimov's. Uh, in 75, he said, I mean, he's, you know, they've all defined it several times, but he said, yeah. science fiction can be defined as the branch of literature that deals with the reaction of human beings to changes in science and tech. I feel like I, I like that because it, it, it kind of refocuses the human element. Um, yeah. In, in the, the story element, because I, I haven't read this. As you guys were talking, I thought about rendezvous, rendezvous with uh, Rama, uh, Arthur C. Clarke. Oh yes, Arthur C. Clarke. And yeah. I can't, I, I can't remember the last time I read that, but a long time ago, and I felt like that's an illustration of like he's really focused on the tech and the alienness, but I'm not so sure he's actually he, he really concerned about the actual human or characteristics no. of a human he's he's no, like this is a fancy new toy story. right and he wants to yeah. write all the details out yeah i i feel like clark is a really frustrating writer in general because of that actually because right. he almost gets there and he's almost really awesome but there's something missing uh, it might be that element a little bit a lot of the time it's, it's just he tries god bless him he tries but you know, it's just, yeah, I, I, I've found that reading Clark can be a pretty frustrating experience. Uh, I love a lot of the, one. Yeah, I like it too. A lot of the concepts are, are there. Uh, uh, I, th as I feel novel, like... I think it really works. Um, uh, Childhood's End, I didn't like as much, but I thought it was still uh, decent. But uh, I liked it. One, I think it was really okay. outstanding. Okay, yeah, I, I like them both. I thought that Childhood's End really... Uh, uh, when I read it, it really captured me. Uh, I think that was that was probably one of my late teen reads or something, and uh, I, I was really captured by that book at the time. But it's something that I haven't reread since. And actually, a lot of these books I haven't come back to because I just kind of feel like they became a part of me. But I almost don't want to revisit them because I'm not quite sure how some of them will hold up. So it'll be interesting, actually, if I do, just to see if they they do hold up 
Uh, yeah, I, I've read all the three Clark books mentioned so far in the last five years, and I think they're all pretty good. Um, I, I, I did not uh, find them disenjoyable at all. Yeah, and so that I, I feel like that particular, for me, that definition of science fiction, I, I kind of gravitate towards more whenever there are elements of the stories that focuses on human sort of perspectives Reactions. and you know what they're going through and i think that's kind of fun because uh this is unrelated science fiction but in tolkien in silmarillions he writes about the mountains that are really literally chapters of it just talking about what rivers and trees and and rocks and flowers <laughs> and like there's no human beings in the chapters no. of the books that he's talking about he's just describing the physical uh you know map <laughs> atlas of the the whole thing and that's it like there's there are just pieces of like that writing where there's no human beings but he's just literally painting the landscape you know it's really dry like a textbook right well, i think that's what's wonderful about starting with literature especially literature in the victorian era is because it is a romantic and it is a gothic and i think that that romanticism is really heavy in a lot of good science fiction literature it, it kind of carries through it's like that's where the lines become blurred because there is such a romantic notion of the martian chronicles there's such a romantic notion in the oh, yeah. otherworldly plane and i think that that's where the human experience in a novel environment becomes its own it becomes its own and and how we react and again it comes down to change yeah i i think that that's definitely true i i think that again rather than seeing it as a genre i feel like it's something that specific authors tend to concentrate on more than others uh I'm you mentioned the martian well, the martian chronicles <laughs> ray bradbury was very much a romantic so you know <laughs> at heart that's that's what he was i mean okay you know, he sort of venerated small town, small town America yeah. in a way. But at the same time, you know, it's like, oh, wow, space, you know, space is so magical, right? And we're going to find all these things and it's exciting. It's also a little bit dangerous, but so is romance, right? You know, that is well, romance. What and, I would and, say and, about and, Bradbury in particular to our conversation is that it's now with what we know in comparison to what we don't and how we move from now to tomorrow and what that means and in every single story in science fiction we can look at it now and how we evolve with what we've created in order to become another tomorrow and that's where that romanticism is embedded in it because there's a now about it I think what's yeah. great about Bradbury, too, is he's really into writing about not only the uh, romanticism, but also kind of the horror that goes along with it. I mean, in the Martian yeah. Chronicles, you know, spoilers, everybody dies. Uh, <laughs> yeah. that, yeah. No way! <laughs> did you guys oh. read the Kaleidoscope? Kaleidoscope is one of my favorite stories by him. And no, it's I haven't read that one. Uh, it's literally a story about an astronaut and all his buddies getting out of their spaceship and then he's falling towards earth and the kaleidoscope is him some kids looking in their telescope looking up at a shooting star but it's really an astronaut burning up in the atmosphere oh yeah fantastic i think that uh i think that that was and, and he actually said that he was really influenced by uh clark ashton smith's story called master of the asteroid which is like a basically a guy shipwrecked on an asteroid all by himself and and like just sort of really alone out there in space and uh nothing around and he's able to survive for a short time but eventually he dies but it's basically his him writing down his thoughts of his strange experiences before the end basically and uh and Radbury actually mentioned that story very specifically and i remember that because i'm a big fan of uh, clark ashton smith sort of a contemporary of hp lovecraft uh, they both wrote for Weird, Weird Tales magazine a lot. And Clark Ashton Smith was very, very much more uh, bald about doing science fiction stuff. You know, he's very blatant about it, whereas Lovecraft kind of just scratched the surface except for in a couple of stories. So, and uh, both Ray Bradbury and Harlan Ellison were guys that we've mentioned 
before in this podcast already were both really influenced by him. So I thought that was cool. I, I like seeing authors pay tribute to people that have come before, and that's always something I pay attention to. So because that that's kind of what leads me to discover cool stuff a lot of the time. So. Yeah, I think homage has I, always been a part of the genre. Uh, one contemporary series I like now, The Expanse, it's really Larry Niven influenced. Uh, oh yeah, and it, it translates really well to the TV screen. Yeah, I uh, want, wanting to start watching that. I actually have the first season, so I'm thinking I'd like to watch that soon. But I heard that it actually it's hard to figure out what the hell's going on until you've already watched a lot of episodes, and it sort of starts to come together. No, I don't know how bad. true that is, but yeah. Okay, yeah. that's cool. I'm looking forward it's, to it's it. Weird, but yeah, and the books are fun too. But it's interesting that now we are going through a new wave of real big production TV and science fiction. So they're starting to tell these really long form stories in a very expensive way that just kind of hasn't happened before. So I think no. in the future we might be seeing adaptations of maybe even some of the stuff we're covering because there's really a gold mine of public domain stuff that if oh, yeah. you want to mine for. <laughs> You know, an expensive, well-done series while you already have a story and a plot and a whole mood to go on. Yeah, and uh, it's not that difficult to uh, take some of that stuff and kind of transpose it to a more modern framework. You know, change a few things here and there, uh, change some of the character inter interactions, you know, and it can be done quite easily. Uh, there was already a really good audio production of the Martian Chronicles recently. So uh, it's kind of uh, done in the style of for, for some people would say it's the style of an old radio play, but actually audio drama has been alive and well for, for many decades. It's never really went away. Just It's just not really as focused upon by the mainstream as it used to be. But uh, in England especially, they've always been big proponents of audio drama. So And actually a lot of that stuff does get covered. Uh, like, like I said, there's a really good Martian Chronicles adaptation already. That was done uh, maybe five or six years ago, and uh, and that was that was really cool. And it wasn't it wasn't just a slavish copy of Bradbury. I mean, they kind of updated it a little bit. Uh, they added more women characters, <laughs> um, and just yeah, it, they probably it was dropped cool. the racist bits too because there are uh, quite a few of those in the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That is. Uh... I mean that's that just continues to evolve. I would say people who don't experience that, you know, the the those type of mediums. Like uh, I think Foundation also got adaptation in the fifties, sixties, seven. I can't remember, but there was a, a uh, obviously a bridged version of that. Uh, I don't know if it was BBC or something. Uh, yeah, I uh, a while ago. I saw something about that. I don't know much about that. Um... I don't know. I don't know how well that was done because it didn't oh, seem really to cheesy. go. Really cheesy. Oh, really? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. But you yeah. know, you, you, I feel like if you know, I made some searches online, and it didn't seem like he's has been a popular uh, author to be adapted in other. Yeah, no. Foundation yeah. in particular is a difficult work because it spans like thousands of years and there's no set yeah. of characters it's basically a collection of short stories all kind of loosely tied together um, right so i'm kind of curious to see what the upcoming adaptation is going to do with it because there's really a lot of material to draw upon and some of it is really interesting in idea uh asimov's you know uh, maybe not the uh greatest prose stylist but he does come up with like a lot of cool ideas that i think could really be explored in an interesting way um, on TV and film. What I would actually love to see is an anthology based on Asimov's uh, short stories in general. I feel like he's, his actual strength is that he was a really good short story writer and he would tackle them from the perspective of, okay, it's a puzzle and here's my puzzle. See what you make of it. Yeah, and, and I think that's actually his strength as a writer. And I feel yeah. like in the novel form, it didn't really come off as well often as it did in the short story form, and I would I feel like like some series sort of in the fa in the vein of Black Mirror, but you know based on on Asimov short stories would actually be really cool, and because you would know you wouldn't know what 
they would tackle next, and and it could be just really interesting. I think that's what Bradbury did, right? Bradbury presents. He had something similar to that a while ago, but um... yeah, he had shows. He had um, yeah, the Ray Bradbury Theater. Or, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, he had he had um, a TV series as well that showcased a lot of his, his short stories. Yeah, I've never actually seen that, but I, actually I may have because I remember I reading a video. All of them. <laughs> oh, I, nice. all of I, think, them. I think a lot yeah, of the new I've... waves and after loves to play in that TV movie realm. I mean, obviously for money, but also just yeah, yeah. Well, beyond that, have, it's interesting. It's also a different way to express yourself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say for new wave in particular, it the storytelling lends itself really well to to visual film and to TV shows, and I think. We see this with Philip K. Dick because so right. many of his stories and books have become films. Yep. And a lot of that is there is a really different type of narration and a different type of visual reality that goes on in the New Wave era. And it lends itself to modern uh, queries, modern problems. And it, it is very modern. It is very now, even though it's 50 years ago or 30 years ago. There's such a now about it that it's very resonant because it was talking about stuff that hasn't even happened yet or is happening right as we speak 30 years from then. I mean, so, but the visual of it is so clearly a progressive of what we are doing. Yeah, I, I think that, that from what I've read of the new wave stuff, uh, I feel like it was kind of like the post adolescence of science fiction in a way where the writers were were thinking okay we're free from these strictures now now we can experiment and now we can talk about things that we didn't really talk about before as much and we can be really bald-faced about it and just you know i, I feel like and it's something that I, you know i, I kind of been observing that that some of the older writers who kind of jumped on board with the new wave it's kind of like they were saying i always kind of wanted to talk about this but i haven't i didn't really have the chance till now because you know i was just writing for magazines and stuff and now i have my own book deal and now i can do this or you know there was there was magazines like uh i can't remember the name of it but uh michael moorcock started it and it was basically geared towards uh new wave sf and i think probably probably some fantasy writing too and it was you know supposed to be a trailblazer in the genre kind of thing and he wanted it to be experimental he wanted it to be free thinking and stuff like that and well uh, i'm going to contextualize it for you i mean I, I personally think that science fiction moves with the context of the times and what did we see the biggest difference between what we talk about historically so what we talk about in the Victorian era and the turn of the century and what we talk about in the new wave, the golden age, whatever, is that technology itself has propelled so quickly, like exponentially changed. Once the industrial Re revolution hit, everything changed because technology from one generation to another, your dad would have no idea what you as a son are going to do as, or even understand what your job is going to be. Does your dad understand what your job as an IT guy is? Absolutely not. Because we are exponentially growing. And I think that's what's demarcated in the new wave and in the cyberpunk era is that it really touches upon the fact that technology is moving rapidly. And so much so that from generation to generation, from kid to parent, we don't even know what's happening next. And yeah. On it, that's my opinion. I think that's actually a really good segue into uh, focusing our discussion right now onto the podcast that we're going to be doing because this is just the introductory episode. And By the way, that new magazine was called New Worlds 64 onward. You, uh, uh, Michael Moore, Moorcock. Moorcock, yes. Yeah. Okay. New Worlds. All right, you found it. It, it. You're doing research while we're talking. Nice. Very good. <laughs> um, but I, I think that's actually a really good segue into um, a question that I have, and that was kind of inspired a little bit by a discussion Anne and I were having earlier today. And I think we sort of agreed on how we were going to handle the next few installments of this podcast, because we were kind of talking a little bit about what approach we were going to take 
as to how to talk about this stuff and whether we were going to go chronological or not. And we sort of agreed on a chronolog chronological approach. It's not necessarily the only approach, but it's a sensible approach that makes sense. But on the other hand, when Ifang was introducing us and talked about how this is how somebody might actually get into science fiction literature, listening to these podcasts and listening to us all, uh, all talk about it, but I'm, you know, I'm kind of thinking, so we take the chronological approach, we're starting really old, and we're progressing forward in time. Now, for a new person, maybe that's not the best approach to take. But now, rather than changing our format, I'm only posing a question as to, and I have, I have my own theories about this, but why do we all think that the really old pre- you know, pre-20th century stuff that seems so far removed from where we're at right now. Why do we think that's important? And why do you think that we should talk about it? Well, I think ideas always have to start somewhere. And doing history is a way to really reflect on the present using the past as a tool for doing that. Um, and using these stories, because I think we've consensus decided on a couple titles that we're going to cover so far. The earliest was published in around 150 AD. So we're going to be going quite a ways back throughout the course of history. And these stories are going to tell us about how people viewed their world at the time. What they thought was possible with existing technology, with existing knowledge that might be extrapolated either to the future or explored in new ways. Um, and I think humans have always had that curiosity. And despite the fact that our worldview, our technologies, um, and our literature has changed so much in the last 2,000 years, the desire to speculate about our origins and where we're going and the nature of the universe has always been with us. So we could use these old stories as a way to reflect on our current situation and uh, where we're going in the future. I'm going to yeah. jump on that. I'm going to piggyback on what Nate said. I don't think I've ever read anything contemporary that isn't bound to its origins, to its core literature or its core nature. I mean, Hyperion and Endymion are a great example. Uh, the Dan Simmons books. I mean, everything that we know now is completely tied to our past. And that's why it's very important to understand our origins before we understand our future. Yes, absolutely, and uh, I think that I think that the definitely understanding where this all came from and where where it's going, but also how it developed to the point that it is now, is so important. And I feel like a lot of people are missing that context because they come into it with something new and they don't explore the history of it. And and I do think that history is important. I don't think you know, like we're we're, we're going to talk towards the end. Uh, about exactly what we're going to cover in the next few episodes, but I think that uh, you know that that people who have a greater understanding of history of things like where this genre they love came from, why people started thinking about these things in the first place, what made people's what made people question the world around them, and how modern authors actually still apply those same principles. Uh, you know, one thing that I'm not sure we're going to talk about too much, but uh, one of the, the more modern books that I was thinking about lately was Hyperion by Dan Simmons, and where he actually builds the entire first book uh, into the structure of Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, mm -hmm. and he basically presents it as a science fiction science fictional presentation that's along the same lines. So it's basically a bunch of people getting together and telling their stories and they all have their own distinct voices and their own distinct styles and their own degree of un perhaps unreliableness. And so, okay, maybe it's a literary rather than a strictly speaking science fiction inspiration. But definitely, even in the Canterbury Tales, there are some strange things happening where you could look at it from a modern perspective and say, wow, that's kind of, you know, they were, they were actually thinking about 
or Chaucer was actually presenting something that seems kind of scientific and seems kind of like some future invention or some hidden invention that we don't know about yet. Um, yeah, alchemy does... plays a major role in the yeoman's tale. Um, and you see other instances of uh, the kind of alchemy, scientific magic, if you want to call it, throughout the yeah. uh, Middle Ages and, and even into the era of the Enlightenment. Definitely. And, and I, I think that that's an actually interesting um, interesting thing that a lot of people nowadays are, are looking back to with the popularity of certain uh, certain aspects of the genre that look to look to the past for inspiration uh, I guess I mean the most obvious one would be steampunk for instance you know where it's like taking these yeah taking these these <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah there, there's so many there are things you could say about that but you know t t taking these these older concepts and thinking to yourself well those concepts are actually really cool and we could explore that more we could explore what if technology took a different path what if uh what if things were really still developed in an advanced way but not in the way that we know so it's kind of an alternate history sort of perspective and and i think that uh that comes from sort of historical ideas and understanding of uh how technology could have developed along different paths you know, what if what if computers were a thing, but they, you know, the printed circuit was never developed or something like that? What would they be like, right? Like they would probably be pretty huge and unwieldy. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> it would be interesting, right? And and I think that's you know, and even thinking along those lines, like alternate histories and alternate timelines, that's definitely become a thing in science fiction. Uh, and not just exploring what if, what will be, but what if, what if this had taken a different course? What would things be like? Yeah, the ENIAC uh, was vacuum tubes, um, which is you know before printed circuitry and transistors. Uh, so I mean, the thing was enormous, and it had a fraction of the computing power that you know even a low end PC today has, yeah, or even a calculator for that matter. Uh, so I mean, the thing was tons. Um, and it's just interesting how technologies can be made completely obsolete by other advancements like that. Oh yeah, yeah that that's always fascinated me, definitely. So you found what? To, yeah, I was no, gonna no, say go so. Uh, I was gonna say so. Um, uh, how are we concluding our um, discussion here? Yeah, so I was gonna say uh, I think we've already come to consensus on a couple titles. Uh, do you think now would be a good time to discuss the titles that we might be covering? Uh, yeah. For the next episode. Uh, let's let's talk about the next few episodes. Yeah. So I think so far we've covered uh, come to consensus that we want to talk about a true story by Lucian, uh, which was written in 150 A.D. Um, it's an early example of space voyage and a voyage to the moon. Um, I believe we talked about Johannes Kepler's Somnium, and I think he's an interesting figure because he's the only actual major scientist figure on this list. So he's that's right. Primarily known for his astronomical or uh, astronomical yeah. work, um, but he also wrote this piece of fiction about going to the moon and I haven't read it before but it apparently contains some really uh, gorgeous description of lunar astronomy that will be interesting to dig into yeah, um, I'm looking forward to digging into that I believe we've discussed Voltaire's Micromegas which is yeah. one of these more philosophical allegory discussions using aliens kind of as a metaphor for different schools of thought and that's something that you see right up to Right up to pretty modern examples of some writers that do that very same thing. Uh, they use aliens as a, a representation of some philosophy or school of thought. Yeah, I mean, uh, even contemporary shows like Star Trek do that to an extent. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I, uh, I'm looking forward to talking about that one. Um, Nate, did you have anything else that we were going to touch on? Um, what were similar titles we read on? I, I know we had uh, come to a couple, but I think those were at least three of us that we all wanted to really dig into. Um, yeah. Which other ones did and, you want to... And possibly the Arabian, uh, the, the Thousand and One Nights. I was yeah. uh, there are certain one, examples. The Atlantis one was cool. But... 
Oh, they oh, knew Atlantis uh, by Bacon. Yeah, yeah, Bacon. Yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. another scientist, so actually that would be a different... Yes. He's a little bit That's of a true. different type, so can we do that one? The... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, that, that one will also be interesting because I was looking at that. I, I haven't read that yet, um, but it's unfinished. So it'll be interesting to look at kind of what he was going for and the circumstances on why he didn't com complete the work. Well, I think that's a really good start for um, the next segment, which would be a proto-sci-fi, which would be like a historical look at science fiction as it started to develop throughout history. Yeah, so that's going to be our next episode. We're actually going to cover a lot of stuff in a huge swath of time, but this is all prototypical examples. So, I, you know, I don't necessarily think that we need to focus too much on specific works as we will in the third episode uh, during which we plan to talk about Mary Shelley and her uh, influence on the genre. She was in, a transitional piece. Yes, definitely. And I think that we all, we all probably agree that uh, Frankenstein and the modern Prometheus was a huge pivot, pivotal uh, cornerstone in this, the birth of this genre. So uh, we're going to spend a good bit of time talking about that in the third episode. And, uh, and we're going to move on. How do we uh, conclude our, our uh, cast? Uh, well, I actually have a, more thing, uh, a few more things to talk about. But uh, if we need to go, we can conclude it now. Uh, I need to make dinner. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so let's, uh, let's just button that up then uh, for the next uh, podcast and for uh, the, the titles we're going to discuss, the proto science fiction uh, list. And uh, we'll go from there. So um, okay. Thank you, listeners, for uh, just uh, listening to us, sort of our inaugural address, as it were, <laughs> of yeah. uh, our treaties on science fiction, you know, from the get-go. And uh, there was a lot of stuff in here. And um, thank you to uh, JM, and thank you, Nate, thank you, Anne, and uh, thanks, everyone, for sort of participating, contributing to just exploring, expanding um uh, you know, even my mind of just uh, listening in and figuring out what what uh, everyone's definition of science fiction is, and uh, and uh, if you want to find more of our stuff, uh, you can uh, go visit uh, anchor.com slash chrononauts plural, and um, for more of JM stuff, do you have any social media or something uh, you want to point people to? It's not really anything I want to plug right now. There's a few things that I'm working on. Uh, you can check me out on Goodreads. Uh, since this is a literature podcast, it's kind of appropriate. Uh, Goodreads.com slash damnable reverend should get you to my stuff. I have a bunch of reviews on there. Uh, not actually tons of science fiction, but there's definitely some up there. And I'm definitely working on more. I just have periods where I don't really do a lot of stuff on there. But... Uh, and working on a couple of other things that I may announce later, but that's uh, that's really it for now. I think, um, you know, I'll maybe share more as we go on. And you want to want to plug the group, maybe the Facebook group. Yeah, you can um, chat me up on the Offbeat. It's a Facebook group. The Offbeat B Movies Cult Grindhouse and Old School. Every Saturday, I do teacher and Saturday morning movie review. So I hope to uh, see you there. How, how do people find that? So they go to facebook.com slash what? The Offbeat. Okay. So B Movies Cult Grindhouse and Old School. It's got a picture of Plan 9 from Outer Space. You can't miss it. <laughs> so if they can search for the, the, the Offbeat and they can find you. Yeah. As well. Okay. Perfect. And Nate? No, I don't have anything. But uh, since we're all in Goodreads, I think we should create a group. And, uh, you know, just give everybody the link uh, when the group's made. Yeah, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. I we agree. should do that. You can find more of my stuff at watchingsilentfilmsplural.wordpress.com. And again, that's watchingsilentfilms.wordpress.com. Okay. All right, guys. Uh, well, uh, this has been fun for tonight, and I'm looking forward to digging into the Enlightenment and before with you uh, for the next time. Excellent. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, listeners, and thanks, everyone, for tuning in. And uh, we'll chat with you next time. Thank you. Bye.